What is up everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Rocket Vlogs, even though I really feel like I don't deserve for you to be here. Here at Rocket Vlogs, myself and the entire team knows that you trust that we're bringing you consistent, good information and that you can believe in everything we're doing and believe that it's all factual. I strive to make all of the Rocket Vlogs content exciting and fun uh, for entertainment purposes. And recently it was brought to my attention that I needed to sincerely apologize for uh, what I believe to be an oversight, but could easily be misconstrued as intentionally misleading. Somebody pointed out, rightfully so, that my three inch Punisher flight wasn't in either the 2025 fail compilation or the fail compilation from all past five years. So on behalf of the Rocket Vlogs team, my editor, my sound guy, my cameraman, my PR manager, my agent, my booking manager, and my social media manager, of course, and me, Rocket. I sincerely apologize, and there's no excuse. The answer for why it's not there is, I forgot. <laughs> fortunately for you, and less fortunately for me, I had plenty of failures this year, so now I'm gonna talk about everything that went wrong in my world of rocketry this year. So let's go ahead and start with the three inch Punisher. In case you're unfamiliar with what happened, here it is. To make a long story short, my friend Jim Scarpine gave me, Shane, and Taylor each a really old K1275, which I believe was from 2001, and uh, they were just in hang tag bags, they weren't vacuum sealed propellant grains or anything, so lighting old rocket motors can be a little bit of a hassle, uh, especially if they're strontium nitrate motors, which is what makes an AP rocket motor red. Taylor flew his, and it worked fine. Shane flew his, in his three inch Punisher actually as well. And it chuffed a couple times, but it came up to pressure okay. So I decided, all right, we're gonna send it, let's do this. But there is footage of me taking apart that whole motor, sanding all of the cores and looking at the oxidization on everything and making sure it was getting the best shot at lighting I could. I don't exactly remember what I used for an igniter either, but it was an augmented igniter. I can't remember if I put propellant in there, if I did BKNO3 or what. And I was most afraid that it would chuff it off of the rail and then just be laying on the ground when the motor decides to pressurize. As you can see, I got chuffing. And on one of the chuffs, the rocket came back down and the bottom rail button snapped off when it dropped hard on the uh, standoff for the rail, which allowed the rocket to turn and then it pressurized, bounced off the rail next to it that had a college team's rocket on it, it ripped both the rail buttons out of their rocket. I felt super bad. You can go f hear the whole story in detail in that video if you'd like, but uh, yeah. So my advice to you is to uh, check your rail buttons on your rockets. If you've flown them a lot, that rocket had uh, over half a dozen flights on pretty spicy motors. It had a K1100, it had flown on a K1275 before, and of course, one of my favorite flights I've ever done, the K2045. So, uh, the rocket tweaking itself up the rails, especially with super hard hitting fast motors and a lightweight rocket like that, eventually can wear down the actual rail button material, but it can also just take a bad effect on your uh, mounting situation. So, uh, I'd advise checking the rigidness of your rail buttons if you've flown a rocket a lot. Moving on, my two-stage project with Taylor. Taylor, for those unfamiliar, is a co-host of the Anti-Gravity Group podcast. That's the podcast that I also co-host about high-power rocketry. You can find it anywhere you find podcasts or right here on YouTube. Go listen to it. We decided we were going to do a two-stage rocket, an M2050 to a K375 minimum diameter to minimum diameter. Neither one of us has ever done a two-stage rocket. Crazy place to start. But somehow we managed to get the sustainer to light. Um, 
You can tell neither one of us expected it by the audio you hear in this clip. It lit. No way. It lit. Oh my God, no. Taylor, it lit. Oh my God. Now, shortly after the sustainer lit, you can see the smoke trail get a little bit funky. Um, what happened was when we were designing the rocket, Taylor told me that it is simmed to around Mach 1.6 for the sustainer, which in hindsight seems crazy slow for a uh, minimum diameter K375 lighting at 18,000 feet or whatever. But, uh, you know, Taylor knows what he's doing, so I was like, yeah, that seems, sure, okay. Had we had the actual number, which worked out to be about Mach 2.6, quite, quite a substantial step in speed there, uh, we would have rethought the design of this rocket a hair because the sustainer was built with pieces of airframe and rocket stuff that I just had sitting around for years. It was a sort of off-center wound G12 54 millimeter fiberglass tube. Uh, definitely not something that was really optimized for a high stress environment. The wall was thicker on one side of the tube than the other. It was just a little oblong and lopsided, but we're like, whatever, we'll give it a shot. The nice thing was it fit, the case fit in there so bad that we could run a whole E-match down the side of it for the sustainer ignition, which is what we ended up doing. And the nose cone was really, really bad. It just looked like it had a real bad time on the winder. And uh, so we think after the motor lit, once it reached max Q, uh, it just folded right at the top of the motor case, which is consistent with the fact that we just suddenly lost the GPS tracking and it never came back. Obviously GPS locks out, but we didn't get anything back ever and we kind of think that maybe it just folded and kind of pushed its way through the electronics bay and destroyed everything uh shout out to my friend chase and his dad jeff who took us all over the place helping us look for that thing and trying to get any signal never found it we did get the booster back though which is great because it had a really expensive 75 millimeter motor case in it and we do plan to try two-stage flight again the rocket was called s p and i think we have to do SNP2, but that's another topic for another day. Up next, my 2.6 inch Rocket Vlogs Edition Punisher. Earlier this year, I teamed up with Wildman Rocketry to release a Rocket Vlogs inspired special edition Punisher. It's the 2.6 inch Punisher. It's still available actually. You can buy it as a whole kit with recovery gear and epoxy and a retainer and everything. It is an awesome rocket because the Punisher is one of my favorite rockets of all time. But doing a 2.6 inch diameter version with a 54 millimeter motor mount allows you literally to fly anything from G to L. And I actually even hosted an altitude contest with the 2.6 Punisher at Airfest in Argonia, Kansas, where there was a cloud ceiling the day of the competition and then a couple people flew the competition rockets the day after so we saw everything from g to l get flown that day that weekend in 2.6 inch punisher so concept proven um unfortunately mine the very first one that wild man ever made i flew at cloudburst in argonia kansas when we first announced the kits were coming out and uh i flew it on a k motor it was made by my friend david reese and it, I believe, was coming in ballistic until the main charge fired and saved it. Yeah. Uh, the shock cord anchor ripped out from the motor tube, so somebody actually wound up finding the nose cone in the electronics bay. So really, I got all the expensive stuff back, except for David's motor case, so I had to give him my 54 1750 case still have hopes that someday someone will find it but my theory is that once it ripped that shock cord leader out that the rocket the rest of the rocket with the motor case and everything just kept coming in ballistic because the rocket landed in an area where people will wind up quite often um, in argonia and i believe the data said it was only under main shoot for like three seconds so that's pretty consistent with it like coming in super fast panic firing and then 
sort of having just enough time for the shoot to open right before touchdown. So I don't think the pieces were far apart, but I do think the fin can's in the ground because typically if you have a rocket just sitting on top of the field in Argonia between Cloudburst and Airfest, someone's going to stumble on it. Nobody did. So I think it's toast. Either way, it was a failed flight. So yay. Finally, my mad cow Bowmark, man. This thing was so cool. Uh, if you're not familiar with the lore of this thing, really, I bought it out of spite. Taylor is a, a big Bowmark fan and something like five years ago, Mad Cow was doing a big sale and he bought one of the Bowmark kits because it's rad. Kind of looks like an airplane. It was like a nuclear capable missile. And a cool guy named Dave down in San Diego listed one unbuilt for sale. So I decided, hey, I'm gonna pick this up. I'm gonna build it before Taylor builds his because it had become a meme that he was taking so long to even start it. It was a really fun and involved build. Like it just comes with a bunch of balsa sticks and dowels basically that you have to shape into everything. And it came out pretty good. I'm not like the most patient builder in the world. So going to something that detailed was uh, a little bit intimidating for me, but I did manage to build it pretty good. I did the Canadian livery on it. And uh, what was best was I hid it from Taylor the whole time I was building it. And him and Sam, his girlfriend came to visit us earlier this year. So I had the whole thing painted and finished. I made my own decals for it and they looked awesome and uh, just left it sitting on my workbench and made him open the door to reveal that not only had I bought a Bowmark, but I had built and finished it before he did. No <laughs> way. <laughs> it was so easy. It took me like two weeks. Two weeks? <laughs> yeah. That sounds like, I thought you said you could build it in a couple of days. Uh, like the hard part, yeah, for the most part. Built in a couple Careful days, the pods like, aren't glued in yet, but otherwise. So like the fully finishing. It's scale. There's like some scale stick welds on there. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good though, huh? When did you get this? Dang. Pretty sick, huh? You Bull, should build one. Bullmark Drag Race? Yeah, I figured I would do the Canadian livery because I figured you'd probably yeah. like the black one. We can't both be... Dude, I made those decals. You like that? It came out pretty good. Dude, the Bo a Bullmark Drag Race would be pretty hectic. Yeah, <laughs> really? It was pretty awesome. Unfortunately, I decided that its first flight should be on an H220 Blue Thunder. And uh, here you go. Oh, just in time. So what was interesting about my ball mark was it was a little bit bendy. Um, I don't know if it was just the big piece of conduit glued to the tube influencing the shape of the rocket or if it was just, I don't know. I don't think it could have been a manufacturing defect because the two tubes met together at the coupler, but it did, the nose definitely bent down. So I think what happened was it was already pre-bent. The H220 is a pretty hefty motor for that rocket. I mean, it's heavy, but it still kicked it pretty hard. I think there was just a structural failure and it tried to bend in half, but the big piece of conduit on the side wouldn't let it fully bend in half. So uh, it's actually floppy now between the two pieces of tube. And you can see that behavior kind of after the motor burned out and it was tumbling back down to the ground. Um, it's definitely fixable, but I have a whole line of rockets that are waiting to be fixed and honestly, I just don't feel like it. Um, it's cool. It still looks really cool. So I've talked about putting it on the wall behind me in here, putting it on the wall behind me in my room for the podcasts. Uh, it, all that really happened was that tube joint became loose and the two pods broke off when it hit the ground. Maybe by the time I get through all the other rockets that need fixed, it'll sound like fun to try and fix the bow mark, but right now it just certainly does not. And uh, I don't fly 29 millimeter stuff that often anyway, so. It is what it is. Mercifully, that is it. That is all the failures I had this year. It was a little bit of a rough year, but I did still fly some pretty cool stuff. And uh, I'm going to be doing a video talking about my favorite flights that I had this year, my personal flights, but I did just do a video talking about my favorite flights that other people did. So if you want to check that out, 
click in the top right here or check the description or just go to my channel and check it out. It's a pretty cool video with some really awesome flights. If you want to help support this channel and support this content getting made and more rockets getting flown, go to patreon.com slash rocket vlogs or you can click the join button right below this video. Thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters and channel members whose names are scrolling across the screen right now. Failures happen in rocketry, and as the great Adam Savage says, failure is always an option, but I like to add that giving up isn't. So keep building rockets, keep having fun, keep flying no matter what happens. We all deal with failure sometimes. My name is Braden Carlson, you just watched a Rocket Vlogs video, and I will see you all next time.